Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I want to present part nine of my series on the selected gross pathology of the cat. And we're going to talk about the urinary system. Before we start, however, as I always like to do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who around the world have provided me so many great images over the years. It allows me to put these lectures together. Let's begin with the most common disease affecting the urinary tract of old cats, and that's chronic interstitial fright. So I would say it's the most common urinary tract disease of cats worldwide, because if the cat doesn't die of something else, eventually it's going to die of chronic renal disease. And look at these two kidneys. They're an abnormal color. Kidneys should be what I call normal kidney color, which is a deep red brick color due to the vascularity. And these kidneys are full of lumps and bumps and divots, and they are this sort of sickly golden color. You can see that there's some size difference, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. There's a little bit of hypertrophy here on the left side, maybe due to hypertrophy of nephrons. As the body loses nephrons, you generally scar them in. You replace them with scar tissue. You don't replace them. But the body has a very limited capability for the remaining nephrons to become just a little bigger to try and take care of the slack. This particular animal is going to have a lot of other problems because a lot of processes are dependent upon the kidney to either produce substances like erythropoietin, so this animal might be chronically anemic, or to filter certain substances from the body, especially to maintain electrolyte balance. What will often happen is as you lose working nephrons, the body cannot excrete phosphorus. And it's very important because it keeps calcium and phosphorus in a very close relationship due to Starling's law. And as you lose kidney mass, the phosphorus starts to go up compensatorily. The uh, calcium will go down, but that only works for a certain amount of time. When that happens, the calcium starts to go down, the body kicks into action, and this hypocalcemia will stimulate the parathyroids to produce parathyroid hormone, which ultimately is going to take calcium out of the bone to maintain the body's needs. You will eventually develop osteopenia, perhaps even osteoporosis or fibrous osteodystrophy. When the abnormal balance of calcium and phosphorus gets over 70, you start to get metastatic mineralization out of the body and mineralization of odd tissues, including the stomach lining and the uh, Bowman's capsules and the vessels of the kidney, which worsens this process. Perhaps the subpleural intercostal muscle. Some of the worst places you can put down mineral is within the lung itself. Now, when you look at the, uh, just one quick hint on the clinical pathology, obviously you're going to look at the phosphorus levels. Those are going to be up. The BUN and creatinine are going to be up. If you look at the potassium, uh, cats and renal failure are generally hypokalemic. Dogs are hyper. Um, so cats generally need to be uh, supplemented with potassium. Now remember I talked about um, the fact that one kidney is big and one kidney is smaller. This has been referred to by a lot of names and there have been lots of uh, opinions on this. I've heard it called uh, unilateral renal atrophy and shutdown by Dr. John King. Uh, the big kidney, little kidney syndrome by Dr. Richard Jankowski. Unilateral renal hypoplasia by a number of people. And uh, I don't believe that this is hypoplasia. It happens very common, and it's usually an of chronic renal failure. Nobody really knows why. When you have a chronic or even an acute renal insult, um, oftentimes you end up with one very small kidney and one rather enlarged kidney. Both of these uh, kidneys are an abnormal color. This is a form of chronic interstitial nephritis. Um, and, and Dr. King used to say, well, the, they're both uh, 
injured at the same time, but for one reason, one shrinks and one gets bigger. I don't think anybody really knows about this, but it's a very common finding in old cats and old kidneys where you'll see that one is going to bigger than the other. And if you ever figure that out, please let me know. Chronic interstitial nephritis is just a, a real problem in cats, or it means that they've had a fairly healthy life and nothing else has taken them out. This is the kidney of a tiger. Um, a great picture from Dr. Kim Newkirk down at the University of Tennessee. And you know, these tigers and lions in captivity, they live to great ages um, in captivity that they never would approach in the wild. And so they're a cat and they often have chronic interstitial nephritis. Um, here's a picture, the cut section of the kidney. You can see the irregular capsule, the somewhat thinner uh, cortex, these rays of fibrosis, which extend up into the cortex. Um, but it's a cat. So you're going to expect them to have chronic interstitial fries. Ferrets sort of go the same way too. They're not overtaken by events. And there are a lot of other diseases that ferrets get. Eventually, the kidneys will wear out. And I think that's good for a lot of species. Kidneys are only supposed to last for a certain time. Because as we said before, you don't regenerate kidneys. It's like the brain and it's like the heart. You can regenerate your liver um, if you take some of it out, but if you have a problem with your kidney, generally that part of the kidney is lost forever and replaced by fibrous connective tissue. Let's go on to another uh, disease that has been best studied outside of the human species, probably in cats. And this is a great picture of a polycystic kidney. There's a couple things going on here. If you have numerous renal cysts throughout the kidney, but look at the intervening cortex. It's absolutely bright white because this has been replaced by all fibrous connective tissue. This is an autosomal dominant disease in cats, which is often seen in Persians. It's thought to affect up to 40% of Persians worldwide. The others, it comes in a number of flavors, autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. The autosomal recessive ones, um, if you have an animal that's, that's homozygous for the gene in those cases, generally those animals uh, are stillborn or they die very quickly after death. They have absolutely huge kidneys which take up their entire abdomen. They look like they're pregnant when they come out and it's just one big cyst. The autosomal dominant, uh, which we see in and Persians tend to take a bit longer to take effect. And this animal will probably live for a number of years before it succumbed to chronic interstitial uh, nephritis, uh, along with polycystic kidney disease. It's often associated with cysts in other tissues, including uh, the pancreas or the biliary tree. And in cats, they have identified two genes, uh, PKM, and PKD1. PKM is a component of desmosomes, and PKD1 is a plasma membrane calcium channel. The loss of uh, a PKD1, this plasma membrane calcium channel, allows tubular cells to enter a differentiating mode, which allows additional tubule formation uh, after birth or uh, maybe even ap apoptosis. Uh, PKM is a component of desmosomes, and they oftentimes the tubular epithelium doesn't have proper connection. And when it's uh, in these animals, when it's separated from the surrounding tubules, you'll have a proliferation of epithelium, which tends to uh, choke off the tubules, forming large cysts. Remember, tubular epithelium, like all epithelium, has the ability to form basement membranes. And it's one of the four main changes in these cysts. Um, there's also a modification extracellular matrix allowing these tubules to become sort of saccular and dilated. Um, and then uh, you have tubular changes which are hyperplastic like we mentioned with the uh, PKD1 gen genetic mutation. And then finally you end up with these large cysts as a result of obstruction of nephron. And the one thing that you have to remember about the kidney is when you have problems with the tubules or obstruction later on down the line, the body doesn't stop making urine. There's no feedback mechanism. It seems like poor planning, but the body will continue to make urine in the face of obstruction 
and you end up with significant kidney disease, either hydronephrosis or the formation of these large cysts. So is polycystic kidney disease a real problem in cats? <clears throat> in the forks, this is a great picture from uh, Dr. Paul Stromberg. It's actually from a mountain lion, as I recall. And it, I use this one because it really uh, hammers in a lot of the, uh, the great uh, facts that you need to know about infarcts, such as A, in the kidney they're generally triangular. The point of the triangle will point to the obstruction. The color of the infarct is also very important. Red infarcts are flat and they tend to uh, be acute. White infarcts are chronic. Now, when we look at it, I said that the infarcts point at their obstruction. Here's a clot right here, which is probably responsible for this large chronic infarct. It's white. You have a depression in the capsule because of scar tissue here. And it's probably one of these arcuate arteries or sublobular arteries right here. The arcuate arteries generally at, are at the corticomedullary junction. The sublobular are down here. The sublobars are farther down here. And I think we have a large obstruction down here out of the planus section on the sublobar arteries. But you can always tell where it ends. Somewhere in here, there's a clot. And we have acute uh, infarcts here, which are incorporating part of the medulla and all of the cortex. And they're in the same area where we've had previous infarction. Now, when you look at something like this, these are often septic, and I would go first thing to the left heart and look on the valves for a septic thrombus. Thrombosis of the left heart will shower the rest of the body through the aorta. Okay, they break off at the atrioventricular valve they shoot down into the left ventricle and back out through the aorta to the rest of the body, and they keep rolling along, these little aggregates of bacteria and fiber, until they get to a capillary bed, which is too small for them to pass, or at least a vessel, which is too small for them to pass through. And this often happens in the kidney. So if you see an infarct in the kidney, first thing that you want to look at, is the left side of the heart for possible vegetations. And, and that what was, that's what was going on here. These were septic infarcts uh, in this old mountain lion. Now, something that looks a lot like infarcts is pyelonephritis. I want you to take a good look at this picture. Um, it illustrates a number of things. Number one, uh, Dr. Stromberg's rule of fine arts number one is that dark colors cover up light colors. Hemorrhage covers up inflammation and necrosis. Everywhere you see hemorrhage in this kidney, that's an area of either suppurative, suppurative inflammation or necrosis. Now, how do you tell that from an infarct? Okay, gets a little tricky. Look at the more diffuse distribution here. Okay, we don't have those nice triangles. This inflammation actually is starting in the renal pelvis. Pyelonephritis is the result of an ascending urinary tract infection. It's inflammation coming up probably from the bladder up through the ureter. It gets into the kidney through the renal pelvis. A couple things that you want to look at to make a determination, at least on an image, where you have no history if this is pyelonephritis um, or not, is number one, is there are there changes in the renal pelvis? This renal pelvis is a bit larger than normal. We have lost some. Something else that you will often see is in pyelonephritis, because of the sharp turns that some of these um, blood vessels make at the poles, it's often worse at the poles. And then we have this streaking. This is essentially groups of tubules which are full of suppurative exudate. This animal um, likely uh, had an obstruction 
might have had feline urologic syndrome and uh, when you have urine stasis you tend to have overgrowth of bacteria and it backs up and so this these areas of white and the hemorrhage on top are groups of tubules which are largely full of neutrophils and the rupturing they're breaking into the interstitium here and we have extension of the inflammation in these larger but these are the kind of things you want to look for look at the distribution more near the poles look at the fact that this inflammation is starting here and going up to the cortex lesions of pyelonephritis are usually worse in the medulla and you will see papillary necrosis in this we'll talk about that in a minute but you often will see papillary necrosis and other changes in the pelvis. Pyelonephritis is most commonly seen in older cats or immunosuppressed cats. Cats that might have a feline retrovirus or feline leukemia virus. So pyelonephritis. Now sometimes it'll heal and you get this scarred kidney, but look at the polar infarct. Okay, we said that it's often worse at the poles. So polar infarcts aren't uncommon in cats. You may see them on both sides. And it often, and we can see some corresponding fibrosis here, it often suggests the animal might have had pyelonephritis. Um, I also see a bit of a dilated pelvis here. So these are some, some little tips and tricks you can do to differentiate uh, an ascending urinary tract infection from maybe a bloodborne uh, renal infection. Okay, there's an absolutely beautiful picture here. This is an old cat, okay? I see a lot of fibrosis and irregular contour here. There may actually be a little bit of inflammation. It's tough to tell. It doesn't look like pyelonephritis. There's not a whole lot going on, but what we see here, uh, right above the renal pelvis, is a focal area of necrosis. Now, if this was a horse, we, were we would just stop and say, hey, this is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Someone gave this animal too much butazolidine, and that's it. And that works a little bit in cats. Sometimes there are some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or cats will get into some of these drugs which inhibit uh, uh, the prostaglandin formation. The blood vessels in the deep medulla are the flimsiest in the world, the basorecta, they're just wimpy little vessels. And what's important to know is that anything that increases the pressure in the medulla is going to cause papillary necrosis. It could be non-steroidals and these vasorectas aren't getting their normal influx of prostaglandins E and I and they just slam shut and you get ischemic necrosis and that's fine. Other things that could happen is you could have obstruction and decrease urinary outflow increases the pressure here and that increased pressure is enough to shut down those vessels or maybe the animal has uh has a urolith it's not in this picture or it has amyloidosis or extensive fibrosis within the medulla all of those things or anything else you can think of that will increase the pressure in the medulla of the kidney is going to cause those vessels to slam shut and you'll get papillary necrosis. It's a very common finding in older cat kidneys or sick cat kidneys, so don't miss that. Now, a lot of times, this will slough out. The animal will just have a bigger pelvis, and you're good. I would imagine this cat had a lot of other things going on, um, which I don't know about, but uh, obviously, if it's kidneys in one of my pictures, that was not a happy ending. Okay, another discolored kidney. Um, if you look very closely, you'll see little reflections, little tiny reflections in here. That's, that's probably a highlight, but you get up in here and something's reflecting back. The kidney is an abnormal color. A lot of it is dead. And this is a case of ethylene glycol toxicity. Ethylene glycol or antifreeze used to be a big problem. Now, we don't use as much ethylene glycol and antifreeze, at least in the U.S. as we used to. But uh, old antifreeze, it was very sweet. It's related to propylene glycol, which is used as a sweetener and a softener in a lot of foods. 
And ethylene glycol is not that far apart. It has a very low freezing point. So you put it in your radiator and your radiator wouldn't freeze. But if you had a leak, the cat or the dog would find it and it's sweet. So they'd lick it. It doesn't take a whole lot to kill a cat. Now, normally, the cats die before they get to this particular point. This animal had to survive for a while because when ethylene glycol gets into the system, it breaks down to glycolic acid and gly glycoaldehydes, and it causes a severe metabolic acidosis. Um, the liver, the alcohol dehydrogenases in the liver, will facilitate that change to glycolic acid. So first thing that you do in people to get into this type of material is you make them drink a bottle of vodka to try and, and take up all of those, occupy all those alcohol dehydrogenases. So it does a metabolize and you have time to treat it. Now, several days later, the animal's not already dead of metabolic acidosis. What happens is the calcium in the body ends up binding. Um, with uh, the oxalate and you get calcium oxalate crystals and they're huge these are huge fan-shaped birefringent reflective as you can see crystals which form within the tubular filtrate they get big they swell and they cause damage to the tubular epithelium shattering the tubular epithelium releasing urine into the surrounding tissue you get a lot of necrosis uh, in the kidney so that combination of uh, acute renal failure with the concomitant hypocalcemia and acidosis is usually too much for animals. Now, could this be melamine? A couple of years ago, we had a, uh, a big outbreak, and occasionally you still hear of melamine toxicosis. And melamine is a proteinaceous compound that has been used by unscrupulous manufacturers in some parts of the world who make Oh, dog food and people food and all sorts of food, and it's protein, so it increases the protein content. So when the protein content is measured of a particular feed, it'll be much higher because melamine has been added. And uh, in the body, it breaks down to melamine and cyanuric acid, and it will form uh, crystals in the deep cortex or the medulla. Uh, a little different than, than ethylene glycol. The crystals actually are, are pretty tough to find because they dissolve in formalin. If you get a really good dose, you will see them. They are darker. They don't look at all like uh, ethylene glycol. And the uh, cortex has, because it's chronic interstitial nephritis rather than this acute intoxication, the uh, cortex has a bit more ragtag, granular streaked appearance with a dilated pelvis. Um, so those are two into crystalline intoxications that you might see. It's not uncommon to see some calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney of cats under a microscope. They always make a couple of them. And then that's not a big deal. You'll see them in every normal kidney. But you will not have any trouble telling that from a kidney in which an animal has gotten into ethylene glycol because there's just calcium crystals all over the place when you uh, uh, use the polarizer on your scope it's going to look like the fourth of july okay here's a pale kidney now cat kidneys can be pale to start with we're used to looking at the outside of the kidney being able to see prominent renal tree and they tend to be a little bit lighter in color than other species this is because cats tend to accumulate a lot of fat in the distal tubular epithelium and sort of gives a lighter color. But this is even lighter than normal. It's a little bit swollen. It's a little bit waxy. This is a tough one to pick up on, a, on a, uh, um, an image. And I always have had trouble identifying amyloid on an image. Well, amyloidosis um, is not uncommon in cat. There are a number of breeds that have a familial form of amyloidosis. It's AA protein. So the amyloid, of course, is an acute phase protein, which is made in response to inflammation. But I think in cats, I would think of breed predispositions. Abyssinians um, have a lot of it. Siamese and other oriental breeds are predisposed. 
Um, interestingly, in Abyssinians, it tends to be more medullary um, than it does cortical. Dogs, it's almost always cortical. It's in the glomeruli. You get a lot of, of medullary amyloidosis in Abyssinian cats. In Siamese, um, you'll see it within the glomeruli. You'll also see it in the space of Dissay uh, in the liver. So um, don't forget, it's a different form of amyloid, island amyloid polypeptide in old cats. So you always look at old cat pancreases, and, and you will commonly find amyloid in the uh, islets of Langerhans, choking them out and making those animals uh, uh, diabetic. Okay, so we talked about amyloid. Let's look at a common problem as we go into the tumors of the cat. And this is no surprise. If you see big white bumps in the kidney of the cat, you're going to think of the most common neoplasm of most systems in the cat, and that's going to be lymphoma. You see a whole lot of lymphoma when feline retrovirus or feline leukemia virus um, was not vaccinated for, and in many parts of the world it still is not. Um, we've gotten away from most of these. We don't see these like we used to. The multisystemic in kidneys are very commonplace for lymphoma to end up. But we do occasionally see them um, in cats as in the kidney as well as other organs. Now, your biggest problem, and if you ever take a certifying exam, you're going to get a kidney with white bumps around it. And another very common presentation um, would be something like this. The bumps are sort of smaller, and the bumps will track the vessels. And this is granulomatous renal vasculitis and nephritis due to a mutated feline coronavirus. It's FIP, and we've talked about this disease in many of the other lectures. And this is what it looks like in the kidney. On cut section, it might look like this. But the key here is it's tracking. It's tracking the vessels. You can sort of see how it's these fluffy white because FIP is a vasculitis above everything else. So I always call it a blank vasculitis, fill in the organ and organ name because it always focuses on the vessels. So when you see this come up, you need to see are the nodules just randomly scattered or do they seem to have a vascular pattern? So for those of you taking certifying examinations, that's going to be a big question for you at least once on your test. Am I looking at feline lymphoma? Am I looking at FIP? This case actually, and this is another great picture by uh, Dr. Paul Stromberg, this case actually ended up being cryptococcosis. So the dimorphic fungi can look like this. There's really no reason uh, that uh, I've seen metastatic carcinomas look like this. So it's not the only rule outs, but uh, for testing, I would go lymphoma versus FIP. As we finish up with the kidney, another neoplasm that could as well be lymphoma is a very old picture, but it demonstrates that renal cell carcinoma in cats has a distinct location preference for the poles. So if I saw a single nodule at one of the poles of a cat kidney, I think I'm probably going to go with renal carcinoma. Uh, of course, that's why, this is why God made microscopes, so we could uh, look at it under the microscope. But looking at a gross picture, and it's on the pole, let's go with renal cell carcinoma. Okay, very common picture, especially in male cats, is what we call the feline urologic syndrome. I think now the appropriate term is the feline urinary tract disease, or FLUT D. I always called it FUS. Um, I still like feline urologic syndrome. And this is a syndrome in which you get uh, plugs in the urethra due to the presence of 
struvite sand, and struvite being a urolith, which precipitates out in animals on a high mineral diet in basic uh, uh, urine. So we always try to acidify to decrease the, the problem. Cats don't have that, female cats don't have that big a problem because your urethra is bigger. But male cats get blocked up by a combination of struvite sand, Cellular debris. You, you can get big struvite urolis in cats, but they tend to give you sand more often. So it's more easily incorporated into these plugs. So plugs are struvite sand, cellular debris, and TAM horsefall protein. And it's like TAM horsefall protein. I never knew what TAM horsefall protein does. It seem to have, doesn't seem as produced by the ascending lupa family. doesn't seem to have much of a purpose at all except to help block up these cats. But those are three components of the plugs. Struvite, cellular debris, and TAM horsefall protein. They get plugged and you get this, uh, uh, it's not just hematuria, and that's what the, the client sees, but you get these uh, um, large areas of mural hemorrhage here. So there is in the obviously the uh, urinary bladder is chronically distended. You get neuro neurologic damage. You can also get vascular damage because when the bladder is is chronically distended, the pressure is going to result in a closure of the more flimsy veins, and you get venous infarcts of the most proximal fundic portion. You also see some hemorrhage here, but you get these big venous infarcts of the fundus of the bladder because it's stretched so big and for so long the normal veins are basically stretched so their lumen is almost nothing so beautiful case a uh, picture by Marilyn Wolf um, of a bladder infarct in a cat and they always look like this and the cause is just chronic overstretching Here's a great picture of the sand, um, struvite sand that you see in these uh, particular animals. And, and whenever you see urolis, you always see a couple of things. And it doesn't matter what species you're talking about. You're going to see two other things. Well, you're not going to see one, but one is you may see chronic uh, bacterial infections. Not that common in cats. The struvites are often sterile. Uh, almost a lot of other species almost always when you see stones, you're gonna see a bacterial infection. It probably has to do with the, uh, the chronic urinary stasis. The other thing is, look at this tremendous thickening uh, or mucosal hypertrophy, almost polypoid in nature. And that's also very common with animals with stones. So when you're looking for morphologic diagnosis, these comes in, come in clumps. Um, urolithiasis is going to be one. The other one is pretty much always going to be a diffuse, or at least vocally extensive, proliferative cystitis. One of the other things in cats that need surgical relief um, would be to, you know, you'll see ureteral plugs, you'll see stuff in them, but you always have to run those ureters as well because they're also a common location for uh, plugs of mucus and uh, this these struvite urolis. And I think we're about to wind up with the uh, a urinary tract of cats. Here's a sort of a non-specific lesion that we see in a number of uh, animal species. It's not just uh, in cats, but this cat, you can see these gas bubbles within the mucosa. This commonly happens in animals with urinary tract infections who are given either who are either diabetic or given a good blast of glucose as part of their therapy and the uh, bacterial organisms they love this stuff they ferment the glucose and one of their byproducts is gas and this uh, is a diffuse emphysematous cystitis there is some hemorrhage on top of it. it's probably secondary to the cat straining trying to pass urine with this grossly almost occluded bladder lumen because of the uh, accumulation of gas within the mucosa. Okay, well that's great. And we are done with the urinary system of the cat. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about the endocrine system. It's gonna be pretty short. So uh, I look forward to giving you that one. And then uh, uh, as I do, I wish everybody a wonderful day. I hope, wish everybody fantastic health to enjoy it with, and hopefully I will see you next time.